Welcome back to Open Bible, Open Life. I'm Carrie Wilson, Communications Director here at Two Cities, and I'm joined, as always, with Pastor Kyle. And uniquely today, Kyle, it's just me and you. Just you and me. We're just hanging out. Yep. It's Looking gonna forward be to great. it. I am too. So normally I would ask you, this would be the time when I would ask you, tell me what, what you know or what we need to know about X guest. But today, I get to share some of my favorite things about you. Uh, Are you ready for this? <laughs> all right, here we go. And while I could sing your acc- accolades all day long, I think what people really want to know are the unique things about there are many. Kyle Mercer. Not all good, but yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, Kyle, one of the things that I've appreciated about you has been your hospitality over the years. Um, you know, you and Margie welcomed me into your home and into your family. We're in a community group early on together. Um, and during that time, um, you were really invested in my life. You know, last week we talked about how Spencer has a stellar record of matchmaking. Yes. And you yourself have dabbled in that in, in the past. Less stellar record, but yes. Yes. Uh, I, I believe your exact words were, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big upside to, to matchmaking. There can also be a big downside yeah. occasionally, yes. Um, but. Joking aside, um, you're also a very disciplined person. If anyone knows you, they know you're disciplined. And when you're in something, you are all in. And I think this is important for people listening to know. Um, From your keto days to the carnivore diet to your newest obsession, what is it? Cold plunging. Cold plunging. Yes, I'm in the fad. (laughs) Uh, Yes, yes. Um, When Kyle Mercer starts something, he goes all in and he brings everyone else with him. Yes, last night, my community group... Uh, came over and they all, well, not all of them, but most of them cold plunged. And the the, the water was anywhere from 38 degrees to 44 degrees. So it was some cold water last night. I, and you wrote me into, actually, Addie, your daughter wrote me into it. Yes, you, you came over and tried it. Yes. Yes, quite the experience. Probably not doing it again. <laughs> you get to know somebody when they get in water that cold, you see the real person. That's What's, for sure. Why are you doing it? Uh, that's a long story. Uh, I have to give a shout out to one of our <laughs> church members, Jason Slaybaugh, who got me into it. It's something I'd seen, you know, I, you could argue about the health benefits. But uh, for me, it's been, uh, I guess it's the discipline of doing something hard every day. It's usually mm-hmm. the first thing that I, I do. This morning, I was about, I had an early morning meeting. So uh, I, it was like 5.15 in the morning. The water was 45 degrees. And I was in there for about five minutes. And I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but it's a time to think, <laughs> pray, clear my mind. And then when you get out of that water, that cold, you are ready to go for the day. It's like drinking a couple, a couple cups of coffee. So, yes. I'll stick to actual coffee. There it is. Yeah. I do both. No. But speaking of discipline, you know, every year as a staff, we you encourage us to pick three words that are going to be our words for the year. I was curious if you would share with our listeners what words you chose. Yeah, yeah. So this is an idea. I can't remember where I heard it. So... We don't legislate it with our staff. Mm-hmm. If you don't want to, you know, live by it, that's totally fine. But in the beginning of the year, you know, I think we a lot of I'll talk about myself. I mean, struggle with uh, having okay, how do what are my resolutions? How many am I going to keep? And all this, and just thought, what would be three words, kind of anchor statements, mm-hmm. things to aim at? And so for me this year, it's order, attention, and strength. Mm-hmm. So order is kind of a nod to Jordan Peterson, who's had a big influence in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and kind of the idea Another of pri- order. Yes, there it is. Uh, yes. The uh, kind of order speaks to the idea of priorities and particularly just so much, in the best sense of the word, but chaos with this new building and new season. And so I wanted to have order. Attention was the whole idea that attention is different than thinking and trying to watch what's happening, mm-hmm. who's coming, and how's how is our church the same and different in this new building? And uh, how's my family changing? I've got a daughter this year who's in sixth grade, which meant youth group so and lovely. braces and middle school sports and all that. And then the last one is strength, which is just I'm going to be 40 in August. And so my, my one of my words last year was faster, which had to do with running. And this year's strength, which has to do with spiritual strength. Like I want to have more power in my prayer life and teaching and preaching, but then just gen- genuinely physical strength as well. That's great. No, and and really, truly, I know I joked about all, all the, the fads that you've been obsessed with, but yes. you are a really a disciplined person, and I know I've learned a lot from you well, about you. being disciplined yes. in my life, so I just want to honor you in that way. But today, you know, we call this Open Bible, Open Life. Uniquely, there's not a Bible in here today, <laughs> and we're not going to be opening one up, but we are going to be talking about how you think through bringing the Word yeah. to our church. I'd love to talk about that. And I'm excited to hop into it, but first, I think not many people probably know how you were called to ministry, and I wonder if you would yeah. share with us briefly about that. Yeah, my story's interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, I tell all the time, I, I say it a couple different ways, but I grew up nominal Catholic, and at 16 years old, I've shared my story many times, but I ended up coming to Christ, both through a mm-hmm. relationship of personal evangelism, my friend Joe Dutko, a great student ministry, and a couple other events in my life, and I, I pretty, I, every conversion's radical, but I pretty radically come to Christ, like light switch on. Yeah. 
And strangely, I, I immediately, I mean, maybe not that moment, but very quickly, I felt called to full-time ministry. And it was very, like like a lot of callings are, it was, it was low resolution. It was fuzzy in my mind. It, it mostly had the idea of, I would love to do what my youth pastor does, yeah. uh, Pastor Colin, if he ever listens, to give him a shout out. Um, and then I think over years, I mean, we could get into this, it, it matured into, I had an opportunity to, to go into college ministry. Mm-hmm. And then really, uh, I've talked about this a little bit, around 30 years old, I kind of had the, the decision of, okay, am I going to do this the rest of my life? Someone, someone's told me that every pastor, maybe this is just senior pastors, but mm-hmm. every pastor needs to be recalled to his same church every five years, that your life, your mm-hmm. ministry, your church, your city changed so much. I think at 30, my life had changed a lot. We were had two kids. I'd done college ministry for almost 10 years. And uh, that was a moment where I was wrestling, do I go into business with my dad? Do I... Um, do I uh, stay in college ministry? Do I uh, it, what, do I do I become a senior pastor? If I do that, what does that mean? Do I do I plant a church? Do I revitalize a church? And that's we could dive into all that, but yeah. that led me into uh, wrestling with calling, getting some wise counsel, and end up getting into the Summit Collaborative yeah. and planning what now is Two Cities Church. Yeah, that's the really short version. That but is. but for me, there's almost been no difference for me in. Being becoming a Christian and being called into full time ministry, which I you know so to good. quote Charles Spurgeon, who's a um, you know the first mega church pastor mm-hmm. uh, uh, from the eighteen hundreds. He he basically defined people define calling differently. He defined it as an overwhelming desire for the work. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know I think certain people this is not you're not necessarily asking this, but certain people have a general calling to full time ministry. Yeah. Hey, I'd love to work for a church. I'd love to give all my time yeah. to this. Uh, put me, put me in coach, and mm-hmm. and I had more of I think a specific calling to teaching and preaching. That was my that's heart, good. and so when I thought about going to business with my dad, I thought you know I could be an elder, a lay elder in a church. That's great, but I knew that if I was going to do the teaching and preaching ministry that I mm-hmm. felt God had called me to, it was going to take up a large portion of my my mind space and my weekly schedule to do that. Yeah, I feel like call, calling the ministry is really something that's hard to ignore. Yeah. It, it, it kind of consumes you, I feel, yes. I feel like at times. I know for me, like <clears throat> even through college and afterwards, <clears throat> um, just like this stirring in my heart yep. toward ministry yep. and not knowing what that looked like. And I remember Pastor Dave telling me, you have a heart for ministry. Yes. You, you want and need to be in ministry. And just like there's so much fruit when mm-hmm. we step into that. You know, and, and before we move on to the next thing, I, I think a paradigm that I've used in wrestling mm-hmm. with when I wrestled and when I've wrestled with some people who've transitioned from, we talked about this with Spencer last week, from yeah. careers into a calling into the full-time ministry and local church ministry. I've always used the paradigm uh, desire, opportunity, uh, ability, and affirmation. That's so good. So uh, desire, do I have an overwhelming desire for work? Mm-hmm. Uh, opportunity, is there something available? Ability, could I actually do it? Affirmation, does anyone outside of my grandma think I would be good at this? You know what I'm saying? So I think when when you have those four things line up, and, and it's sad because sometimes you'll see two or three of those in a person's yeah. life. They're 45. They don't know if they could make mm-hmm. the change or whatever. And for me, it was just those – honestly, I mean, part of I think maybe what we'll get into today is I – I can't believe this is not like some kind of cheesy mm-hmm. thing. I genuinely can't believe what I get to do for a living. Yeah. And it's a great fit for me. Yeah. It's a great joy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm I'm very grateful for how my life has turned out. That's so good. I feel the same way. Um, you know, as you were talking through those different c- categories to think through, I think that's so helpful because you just think about the kid on American Idol. That's Well, my grandma thinks yeah, I'm right. an amazing singer. Listen to me sing. Yeah, that's right. Oh, and then it's just heartbreaking when, when ultimately it leads to failure. So those are really helpful. Um, I think we're going to have to go back to those later. Um, when we talk about that call, calling uh, in our lives, and we talked about this a little bit last week, a lot of the times we specifically are talking to the congregation about a call to be on mission where you live, learn, work, and play. Mm-hmm. But uniquely, um, the calling to vocational ministry is a— it is a little different, and yeah. it's really important. We don't talk about that as much on yeah. a weekend. Is there anything else you would say about that? Before I, I think I've on? talked about this maybe once or twice on a Sunday sermon, but basically, I'm always looking for like in culture where have we maybe gone yeah. to the other extreme. And so, I, I again, I didn't become a Christian until I'm 16. Mm-hmm. I didn't grow up necessarily in the church. But I know there was a time where there used to be in churches, especially Baptist churches, there was a call to salvation. That was the altar call. Mm -hmm. And then there was a call to ministry, to full-time vocational ministry. And uh, you'll hear people say things. I've talked to many people who said, oh, under, under Mark Quartz at Calvary. You know, just down the street. Um, oh, I, that, under his ministry, mm-hmm. I was called to full time ministry, and so uh, I do think there is a. Uh, it's hard. I'm trying to think about how to talk about this. That's like okay. it's. Um, I don't think that obviously that full time ministry is a higher calling than no, business yeah. law teacher 
homemaker, any of that. Um, but I do think that w- th- there is something, um, if I can use this word, I think special. Like I just feel mm-hmm. like I feel constantly, man, I am able to give my full time, full attention. Yeah. I'm so grateful for the generosity of the church. Uh, because of the generosity of the church, there are many of us now on our staff who are able to set up the our full schedule, full thought life, yeah. full energy to serve the church. And so I just, I feel very grateful for that. It, it really is such a gift. I think about how grateful I am for people's generosity in our church all the time. And yes. like, this is what we get to do yes. every single day. It's crazy to me. Um, what, so when you consider your role, though, obviously you felt the call to yes. be a pastor. Um, what do you consider to be your main role and responsibility here at Two Cities Church? Yeah, well, um, it's a long—I you know, kind of think of like—I think the average person thinks what I do— which is, <laughs> which is true. I mean, they think like, you know, I teach on Sundays and I do. Yeah. Uh, and we've even had people before say, what does Kyle do all week? You know, he, t- he teaches for 40 or 45 minutes, you know, job. and uh, my favorite answer to that is, you know, pa- pastors only work, you know, an hour a week. My favorite answer to that, I heard some guy say one time is, uh, yes, and Olympic athletes only work once every four years. Uh, in the sense <laughs> that there's so many other things that go behind the scenes yeah. that lead up to that. Uh, you know, it's interesting that you asked that question because I have, um, a couple of years ago, I was in a cohort and... I had to clarify my role. They, mm-hmm. they said, hey, we want you to think about, you know, how do you, what are the three, four, five, six, seven things that you do? Mm-hmm. And so for me, <clears throat> I can double click on any of these, but for me, yeah. I, it came down to model the life, teach the church, um, lead the staff, mm-hmm. uh, inspire the elders, mm-hmm. uh, fund the future, move the rock. Yeah. And Influence so the, the kingdom. Influence the, the Kingdom is, is a larger ministry yeah. that I have, yes. But when I think about, sorry, what yeah. I do, particularly here at Two Cities, that you're, you're right. Those are those are the main things that I do. Um, it, it's interesting. I think we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the teaching and preaching ministry. It's definitely what takes up the vast majority, yeah, sure. and it's it's part of how I inspire the elders. It's part mm-hmm. of how I fund the future. It's part of how I lead the staff. It's part mm-hmm. of how I model the life. That's good. And so, um, yeah, we'll talk about how kind of maybe my schedule breakdown and how that works. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I would say on average I, it probably takes me 12 to 15 hours of mm-hmm. focused work to write a sermon. Yeah. And then, you know, the vast majority of course of Sundays is the teaching and preaching and application of that in people's lives. So when you add that up, you know, all of that, it's probably a lot of times half my week goes to that message. Yeah. yeah. And and most people probably don't know that. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. think that you would be able to even spend that a lot of pastors that carry multiple roles in their church don't have the opportunity to invest the no, kind of time you do in a yes, sermon. Yes, I think yes. that's really a gift to you, but also a gift to our church. That your te- your teaching is so rich because of the time you're able to give to us. A hundred percent. If it wasn't for our our staff, our elders, uh, all of our volunteers, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I genuinely feel freed up mm-hmm. to do a few things and hopefully do them well, mm-hmm. uh, and to be able to think not just not just be in the church mm-hmm. and you know in the ministry, but work on and above it. So very 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 grateful for that. Yeah, no, that's really good. The first one you have listed is is model the life. Why do you have that one at the top of the list? Well. One, I guess it's a, uh, when I think about 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, mm-hmm. Titus 1 is very similar, 1 Peter 5, Acts 20. I think mm-hmm. those are the four key texts on pastor elders. Yeah. They all start with character qualities. And so to me, it's, you know, I have to lead myself well. I have mm-hmm. to lead my wife and kids well. Um, I have to be personally experiencing everything yeah. that I'm teaching. And that's always hard because, you know, every once in a while we'll have someone on our staff and they're teaching, uh, I make up a topic, they're teaching on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And they'll come up to me while they're teaching on forgiveness and they'll say, man, do you just feel like, I just feel like there's things I need to forgive this week and Mm -hmm. I feel like I need to be a more forgiving person and I feel like, you know, and I'm like, I feel like that every week of my life. You know, in the sense of when you're teaching week in and week out, you, I think as a pastor, I think I'm still learning all this. I think you try your best that week. Like I am trying to live above approach in this area. I'm trying to clean up my own conscience. I'm trying to apply the text to my own life. Uh, I'm going to try to live this out like I'm going to challenge congregation, and then next week there's a new topic, new text, yeah. new theme that we're that we're going to trace together. And so this is truly one of the things that I love the most about you. You are such a humble and teachable person, and who we see up there on Sunday morning is is who we would see if we ran into you the rest of the week. Well, thank you. And I, I, I mean, I tell people that all the time, and. Um, it's very clear that yeah. you take that seriously. We talk a lot about how ministry is a lifestyle job a lot of times. Oh, yeah. Somebody runs into you in the grocery store. You're still Pastor Kyle. They yep, run into yep, you yep, yep. at your kid's soccer game. You're still Pastor Kyle. And so in a lot of ways, you you, you have to be uniquely you and all those Yeah, habits. yeah. And the reason I think model life is so important is I do think that burning out in ministry or blowing up yeah. ministry, which there's many reasons That's it can huge. happen, but I think one of the reasons it happens is a person's private life and personal life is so different than their public life. Mm-hmm. And I don't know the stats on how long you could keep yeah. that up, but that would be, I think it's, it would be exhausting. 
And so exactly. I think there, there's something, there's some freedom in just saying, man, I'm all in. This mm-hmm. is, you know, and I'm going to try to be a humble hypocrite. And, you know, in areas that I struggle, I'm going to try to talk about my weaknesses. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, a lot of the language of elders, which is the same thing as pastors, mm-hmm. I know you know that, but um, is, is the language of being among people. So to me, it's how do we continue to remain uh, available, approachable, accessible? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons that I, j- not just me, but all of our staff, especially our pastors, we try to be available for and after services. Yeah. It's like I'm not, you know, preach and then go hide somewhere, you know, and see me next Sunday. It's like I want to be out and about. And, yeah, and then I think, sure. I think model of life is so important because, you know, I want to give illustrations of what it's like to live the Christian life, not yeah. what it's like to be a pastor, if that makes sense. I don't want to tell people, you know, it wouldn't be helpful if I said, man, I, I preached this message, and then afterwards this person came up to me because they had these questions about my message, and I led them to Christ. It's like, that might be encouraging to someone, but no one else is going to be able to model that. And yeah. so I like to much more talk about, hey, listen, I, you know, marriage is hard, and raising yeah. kids is difficult, and I'm in it with you guys, and I'm kind of scared to talk to my neighbor about Christ, even though I'm a pastor. And I just, I just think, someone told me years ago that, if you share your strengths, it creates distance. If I started to, you know, if any of us did that, but if you share your weaknesses, it draws people in. And so it's something I need to get better at, but just want to learn how to just, hey, I'm in it with you guys. Uh, now, on Sundays, I talk a lot of some of you and I and I mm-hmm. applied a lot to them. Yeah. And I think that's because I've tried to apply it to myself all week. And I think if I talk about myself or my own struggles too much, it gives people a hall pass potentially. So I want to, it's always getting that tension right. You know, hey, I want to be authentic, mm-hmm. vulnerable. At the same time, I want to, in the most loving way, push and press on yeah. you in this moment, whoever you are, to live this out because I've been trying to do this all week. That's kind so of thing. good. Yeah. And I can't can't wait for us to get more into this today because what we're going to be talking about is is how how you get to that place of being on that stage and that platform on Sunday and delivering that message yeah. to us, what goes into <clears throat> that process because most people don't know what that looks like. Yes. And I actually think there's probably some things that we're going to uncover here today as we're talking about this that could be helpful for our own time in the Word and how we approach the Bible. So I'm excited for us to do that. Um, I, really, I just want to hop right in. Let's do and it. Honestly, what would you consider to be your style of preaching, and why do you preach this way? Oh, man. Well, I, I think there's different styles. You know, there's the very formal style. There's the very, like, I'm a very different... I don't mean this in a uh, manipulative way or in that this is a wrong way, but there's there's the preaching that's, I'm very different in the pulpit than I am in the, uh, you know, uh, in the lobby, for example. And, and a lot of that is the seriousness of preaching, which I believe in. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some people who would say, hey, you know, I know whole tribes and teams and traditions that say, basically, uh, don't tell personal stories. Uh, no humor, please. Um, don't use uh, yourself as an example. All of that kind of stuff. Um, don't. Yeah, anyway, I could go on and on. But I, I, I th- yeah, it's a value to me. I, as I thought about this, I would say casual and conversational, yes. but very calculated and convictional would be in the sense of I want people to feel like the way I think about preaching. I think about it a lot of different ways, but I think about it in like I want people to be in some ways disarmed. Uh, hey, we're just having a conversation. Um, it's kind of like, I, I think about preaching as if like you were going out with somebody that on a walk and you wanted to talk to them about something very important from a Bible text. And you wanted to know what you wanted to say to them, mm-hmm. but you don't want them to know that you've thought about this for you know five hours of how you're going to ask them the question. And so to me, I want something to, I'm trying to even give an example. Uh, you know, some of the phraseologies that I'll use or the language or the categories, uh, I want it to feel very casual. It's one of the reasons yeah. I don't use PowerPoint. I mean, I'm not against it. Uh, the one of the reasons that I don't use a lot of points and pictures and mm-hmm. placeholders on the screens is I don't want it to feel like a lecture. I want it to feel like an experience that we're having. So I, I you know, I, I want there to be. Um, we can get into all this, but different emotions people feel. I want yeah. to take people on a journey together. Yeah. So, but in general, I would say I want it to be same Kyle that you saw in the lobby is here. We're having a conversation, and I'm more prepared to have this conversation than you think I am. Yeah. And uh, but I don't want it to feel that way. Yeah, and I feel like I mean, would you say that you've grown in this a lot over the past? Oh, several definitely. Years? From the beginning of launching the church to now, how have you seen that transition? Well, general? I mean, it's a couple different things. I mean, one, um, oh man, there's so much. That's a good question. Um, say it all. I'm trying. Well, I'm trying to. Uh, teach without notes. Um, not, now, I have notes up there. Uh, the average person might be surprised to know that my average sermon outline is, I mean, you've seen them, is 20 to 22 so pages. Yeah. I think it's close to 7,000 words. Um, so, I mean, I'm writing a lot during the mm-hmm. week. Um, but what I'm trying to do is internalize that so that, um, I, you know, here's what I say. In preparation, my focus mm-hmm. is clarity. 
in proclamation, my focus is connection. Yeah. So when I'm in my study, I'm thinking, what's the clearest, most concise, most emotional uh, way to say this? Uh, most pithy, memorable way to say this. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm with them, I'm like, I just want to be free from my notes so that I can connect. Now, I've got a lot of guys, even other guys who preach in our church won't, yeah. will use notes, and that's totally fine. Totally uh, to fine. me, though, I, I think there's something uh, about, man, if I can't memorize my sermon, why would I expect anyone else to? And that's gold. So I'm like, if I can't, if it's not simple enough for me to, and I think part of my my sermons became more simple mm -hmm. And I don't mean not deep, hopefully, but I mean they become more simple when I had to go to four services. Mm -hmm. When you have to say the same thing four times, um, you know, it, it makes you have to go. What's the simplest, most straightforward, memorable version of this? And you know, I think preaching multiple services, which you can also talk mm -hmm. about at some point, um, I think makes you, you you don't want to preach a bad sermon once. You certainly don't want to preach a bad sermon four <laughs> I can't times. Imagine. You know, so uh, you want to feel confident when you're getting up there. Yeah, you know. One of the things that we've communicated from the beginning is that we're a church that strives to be expository in our teaching. Yes. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So there's two types of – well, there's many types of pre yeah. preaching probably. But I think of two types. There is uh, verse by verse. That's what we do. And that's expositional. Mm -hmm. That just means, as you know, but that means um, to expose the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I'm trying to do, uh, to make the main points of the text the main points of the sermon. Yeah. Um, then there is verse with verse, and that's very common in a lot of large churches. That's I, I'm, I've done that before. I'm not against that. I'm More like topical. That would be topical. That would be like, hey, guys, we're going to talk – pull up a theme I said earlier. We're going to talk about forgiveness, and mm -hmm. we're going to look at the five most famous verses on forgiveness, and we're going to pull out an element from each of those mm -hmm. and learn what forgiveness is. Yeah. I'm fine with that. But for some reason, I don't know what it is with my personality. I'm very focused on the immediate text. I will rarely take the church to another text. I will tell them a story about another text. I might mm -hmm. say, this reminds me of Elijah, and I'll just tell yeah. that real quick. But I will not normally say, all right, turn to Colossians. Okay, guys, now turn. If you can find Galatians, mm -hmm. let's go there. So I like to stay in one text. Um, and I just think that expositional preaching uh, does a couple things. These aren't new with me, but these have been, I think, well stated. One, it makes you... Uh, deal with all parts of Scripture, especially yes. the hardest parts. Yes. Um, it gives the, the church a steady diet. It, it creates a little bit mystery and adventure for me. Like, I'm not smart enough and creative enough, creative enough to be like, man, you know what our series... Our, our <laughs> church needs a series on seven things to know before you get married. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know what those seven things are. But if I preach through Ephesians 5, I'll learn a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tend to learn a lot. It's an adventure for me. We can talk about how yeah. we get from Monday to Sunday. But like for me, I don't know what I'm going to talk about each week. I mean, I, yeah. I have the text. We have an idea of theme. Often mm -hmm. can change. I know yeah. that's hard on the communications uh, department. It's okay. We, uh, we but roll. to me, it's the adventure. It's like, okay, you know, this week in the sermon I just preached, Second yeah. Corinthians 1, it's like, okay, we're going to talk about comfort. What am I going to say about comfort? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I need to study it this week. So I think, I think expositional preaching, it keeps the pastor fresh. Mm -hmm. It keeps the church getting a comprehensive diet. It keeps the pastor from having his hobby horses. Yeah. And they can be good hobby horses. It's yeah. like, this is the world missions pastor. This is the, you know, family discipleship pastor. This is mm -hmm. the, you know, money generosity pastor, whatever it is. It's yeah. like, to me, it's like over the year. And what I found is we get a steady diet. We talk about manhood and womanhood. Mm -hmm. It comes up. We talk about sex and marriage. We, we talk about money. And, 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 it, and nobody thinks, hopefully, that I have some type of agenda. It's like, no, we're talking about money because we're in Second Corinthians 8. That's good. You know, that's why we're talking. We'll, we'll be talking about suffering mm -hmm. because we're in Second Corinthians 11, not because some terrible thing's happening in our church. You know? Well, and I think uniquely, when you pr preach expositionally, what it allows the congregation to do and what it's allowed me to do is learn more about how I can approach That's right. the Bible. And I, I think Bible literacy is is a big issue these days. And so the more that we can see you model what it looks like to go to the Word and see what God has to speak to us today, yes. the more we're able to do that on our own. Yeah, yeah. It, it really does teach you inductive Bible study. Mm -hmm. I mean, all I'm doing is saying, okay, let's observe, let's interpret, let's apply. Yeah. And we're doing that together, and I'm trying to even show them, hey, and I asked this question, why does mm -hmm. the word comfort show up 10 times here, for example, in this text? Okay, guys, what's repeated is important. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this, and hopefully good. they're like, okay, now when I'm studying, I'm going to, you know, I, tr I want to demystify the difficulty of studying the Bible. I think the first time we did this was when we went through Judges years ago. Yeah. And I had several people say, that was a very scary book before you preached through it. You know, it's <laughs> like, but now I feel like I can read Old Testament narrative. Great. That's one of our goals. Well, and I think a lot of people felt that way about Habakkuk. If they were just to read that on their own, I'm like, what is in this for me? Yes, but when yes. you were able to help us learn how to unpack that, yes. it came to have a lot of meaning <laughs> for a lot of people. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, too, one of the things that's unique about your teaching style is that you really draw on cultural connection. Yes. Did you hit on that? Yeah. So I have three categories when it comes to teaching, uh, true, clear, and real. 
and so we can walk through these briefly, but uh, true is the foundation. And I think most young pastors, in my humble opinion, spend too much time on true. I mean, I, mm-hmm. now, of course, you want to know the truth of Scripture. Mm-hmm. But what I what I tell a young preacher pastor is if, if you're still trying to figure out what's true in this text on Wednesday or Thursday, it's probably not going to be a great sermon. Um, mo- and, and I think most pastors who've been teaching, they've read their systematic theologies, they've gone to their seminaries, they've sat under good preaching. Mm-hmm. Very rarely, and I'm not like some great Bible expert, but very rarely do I ha- do after Monday, I don't know what the text is about. I'm like, I know, okay, this is a text on God comforting us in suffering and us comforting other people. Now, where am I going to go with it and how am I going to apply it? That's different. So truths, you know, I, and I think there are certain preachers, and I think this is really good, like, and I think it's okay to name names. I mean this in a positive way. But if you think about someone like John MacArthur, mm-hmm. uh, who is in his 80s, still doing faithful ministry, preached through the whole New Testament, I think, one, you know, I mean, amaz- amazing. A lot of us have John MacArthur study, study Bibles. Study Bibles, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure many listeners, most listeners here probably know who he is. When I listen to a John MacArthur sermon, which I often do, um, I usually listen to it at 2X, and it's true. It's mm-hmm. very true, and it's clear. We'll get into that. But it's mostly true. He's not worried about the culture. He's not worried about applying it to, in my opinion, to a lot of different situations. Mm-hmm. It, but like, so I'll listen to John MacArthur. I'm like, what's the... What's the history of this text? Yeah. What's the theology? Of the, like, I want to make sure I don't want to say something heretical. Okay, good. I got it. <laughs> um, and then there's clear. And clear is like you, we might say, like an Andy Stanley. Okay. Now I know he's been all over the map theologically, so I'm not endorsing his uh, necessarily his teaching ministry. What I'm trying to say is very rarely will you listen to somebody who's not as clear as Andy Stanley yeah. is. I mean, when he said, you know, the, the, his famous principle of the path, for example, that direction, not intention, leads to destination. It's like, mm. well, that was clear. And so he is just so simple and so clear. Mm-hmm. Some people might say, well, was that true? Was that in the Bible? But man, was it clear. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's real. And real is, um, man, you know, the, the greatest comments I'll get in my sermons are something like, hey, are, do you have video cameras in our house? Mm-hmm. You know, which is, it's like, no, I don't. But thank you for the comment. Because people, I want to speak to people where they are. Mm-hmm. And real is like, so some things you do when you when you try to make it real, you say, you ask questions like this, why do we resist this truth? Mm-hmm. So that I'll just sit in my office and I'll just think, God says that we should be comfort, we should comfort others. Well, why don't we? You know, or God said we should be comforted by others. Why aren't we comforted? And I'll just sit there. And it's mm-hmm. it's the hard for sure. The I would say Monday for me is true. Tuesday is clear. Mm-hmm. Wednesday and Thursday are real. And that's mm-hmm. that is the hardest work by far. Um, in my, in, in my, and I, I think at the end of the day, that is what my responsibility is. If somebody mm-hmm. wants to know what is true about the text, they can buy a ten dollar commentary mm-hmm. on Kindle. I think what they want me to do, or whoever's teaching to do, is make it real to them. You and, know, and I think that's important because I've been in churches before, um, none that I stayed at for a long time, but where you can leave every single week and not feel challenged to do anything or change anything in your yes. life. And I feel like every week. There's something that you're saying that I'm like, okay, this applies, and I need to make this shift, or I need to make this shift. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here's an example. I mean, someone might say, okay, the story of the guy with leprosy or mm-hmm. something, you know, from the Old Testament or New Testament, you might say that. And, and, and I'll listen to certain pastors, and they will go for five... I'm not trying to critique pastors. I'm just trying okay. to give an example. Um, and and they will do five or ten minutes on what leprosy is. Leprosy was this, and here's what... It, and it lasts this long, and I'm like, I'm not sure why you're telling us this, because I don't. none of us have leprosy. I don't know if you're trying to... It's just uh, pastors can struggle with. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're trying to impress with your knowledge. But like, let's get to the real thing. Hey guys, you know they didn't like to hang out with lepers, and there's certain people you don't like to hang out with. Mm-hmm. And he, it would just get, and yeah. also you, you'll you'll feel it in the room. Like, oh, it just got quiet. We're talking about real life stuff right yeah. now. And so uh, another thing I often do in making it real is I often just think, man, whatever the Bible's telling us to do, we're probably doing the opposite. Yeah. Whatever the Bible's telling us to believe, we're probably believing the opposite. Whatever the Bible says uh, we shouldn't believe, we're probably mm-hmm. believing. And so I. I start with that assumption, and that usually helps me create the right tension in the sermon. That's good. Uh, another thing that I say, I, and sometimes I will, uh, actually not sometimes, always, on my notes, I write mm-hmm. like a, some statement for myself to think about, um, and it, it changes in seasons. A lot of times it's the same statement every time I'll write on top of my uh, sermon notes. And more recently, I, I've been writing, solve people's problems. That's great. And so it's like, man, what are the problems? Like from the text, what are the problems people are having? Mm-hmm. It's like people are suffering and they don't know where to go for comfort. Mm-hmm. People are afraid to take risks. You know, whatever mm-hmm. it might be, people people aren't praying with and for each yeah. other. And we just say, okay, let's let's try together. You know, I'm on this journey mm-hmm. too. I need help. Let's try to solve these problems together. Mm-hmm. Well, and uniquely showing them how Christ is always a part of yes. that answer. And I think that's another thing that you do uniquely in your sermons is when you are reading 
the scripture and like expositing it to us, you are doing that through the lens of Christ. Can you talk to us about the importance of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think the lens that I usually use in studying scripture is what's called, I think it's officially called the historical grammatical theological lens, which is a big mm-hmm. fra- way to say, I read the text and I go, what did this historically grammatically mean? Mm-hmm. Like, what is Paul saying to the Corinthians at 54 AD or whenever you read that? And then the theological is trying to, best I can, bring all of my knowledge of the scripture mm-hmm. to that situation, uh, a theology of suffering, you know, which is going to, of course, lead you to Christ. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's many different ways to get to Christ. I want to get better at that. There's there's yeah. the uh, – Brian Chapel. he wrote a book on preaching. He talks about what's called the fallen condition function, mm-hmm. something like that. And he basically says, what part uh, of the gospel in this text is speaking to our brokenness? Mm-hmm. Sometimes that might be a need for grace in a situation, or a need for forgiveness in a situation. Sometimes, sometimes it, the classic Tim Keller is Jesus is the truer, better Joseph or yeah. Abraham or any of that. So, yeah, that's something that I try to do. Um, you know, sometimes in the middle of the sermon, I, I, I've gone and gotten into different habits. There was a season where I tried to end every sermon, and it felt a little cliche to me at least. Um, but yes, we definitely want to have the Jesus Christ is the hero. He is the center of Scripture. I mean, that's what he teaches in John 5 when he confronts yeah. the Pharisees. The Scriptures speak to me. That's what he says in Luke 24 when he's on the road to Emmaus. So trying to be Christ-centered in, in mm-hmm. all the preaching. Well, and and we hit on this a second ago, but I want to go a little deeper into this. Um, you are very culturally aware uh, and aware of what's happening in the world around us, and you try to tie that awareness into teaching, which does deal with the problems that we have and things like that. But also, uniquely, um, we know that the Bible is living and active. We see that in Scripture. So it should be able to apply to every situation. And so the things that are happening in culture, we need to apply the Bible to that. Can you just talk about that briefly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so I try to critique both the culture and the church. And if I can do it, try to do it equally. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, this week in my sermon, I said, hey, the world uh, uh, tends to assume the grace of God apart from the cross of Christ. Mm-hmm. We talked about that for a few minutes, and I tried to give some examples. Um, and then I said, and here's what happens with us Christians. You know, in the church, we tend to just assume the grace of God in a different mm-hmm. way. We tend to think, I'll do this and God will forgive me. And it's not a big deal. So it's not a big deal because of the cross. I'll, I will. I know it's because of the cross, but that, that gives me the excuse. God's job is now to forgive me. I'm going to heaven. And so I try to think genuinely on like, what is the religious spirit? Yeah. That needs to be confronted in this. What is the rebellious spirit? What does the church think? You know, it, how is the church thinking wrongly? How is the world thinking wrongly? And I don't always get that tension right, but I think mm-hmm. that's I think that's uh, endearing to the seeker skeptic who shows up. Hey, we're we're willing to call ourselves out the goofiness so of important. of the of the church in some ways. When we did that, and what's wrong with the church? There, yes, that was um, the whole point of that series. Yeah, we'll link that series in the Great. show notes so people can see it. But that was the whole point of it. Um, speaking of series, though, how do you even start to map out where you're taking the church for the course of the year? Yeah, uh, man, it's it's changed. I we're, I think we're in a much mature much more mature version of it now than, mm-hmm. than I was seven or eight years ago. Um, so basically we have, uh, how do I think about this? Um, I try to be six months ahead in pen, mm-hmm. the next six months ahead in pencil. And like, your communications director appreciates it. Yes. That. And you have, you have been very, very helpful in me doing that. Um, so what I, so a couple foundational things. Uh, I like to be in all different parts of the mm-hmm. scriptures throughout the year. Um, so we're going to do that this year, uh, without kind of going into all the series that we're going to go into after second Corinthians. But, um, the second thing is, and this is, you know, I have alliteration for everything uh, just to help me remember it, but I think of yeah, the, the spirit, Baptist. they're true Baptist. Uh, this, for me, it is the spirit, the scripture, and the schedule. This may be too okay. technical for people. The spirit is, man, what is God putting on my heart? Mm-hmm. Um, not just mine, but just as I talk to our staff, yeah. as I listen to our church, mm-hmm. as I look at the culture, man, that that's the whole like, man, we're, so example, we're going to be in a brand new church building, lots mm-hmm. of new people. Church growing like crazy. Okay, I think we should do a series on the seven letters. Why? Mm-hmm. Well, let's tell the people in our church what the real church is. Yeah. Let's let's have that winsome, hopefully humble critique of ourselves mm-hmm. that the world might or the the seeker might be interested in. Um, so so there's that. Uh, that's the spirit. Then there's mm-hmm. the scripture. It's like okay, well, what text? And that's wanting yeah. to be in all different parts of the Bible. And then sometimes it's the schedule. It's like okay, mm-hmm. well, we want to you know we want to candidly we'd like to launch a new series after Easter. So why was Habakkuk three weeks and not four weeks? Um, because Lee Strobel is coming. <laughs> that's really yeah, the answer. That's true. It would have been. I mean, I you know, weird to say. Yes, Habakkuk yeah. would have been a four week series if if it not. And so mm-hmm. I think you can flex it a little bit. I would have emphasized mm-hmm. a couple different things. We would have had a different final yeah. service. But um, that's how I think about it. And then you know, to me, I try to. Here's a kind of a larger picture. Okay. Uh, and I got this from Tim Keller. Um, you know, who who passed away this last year. But um, 
he said, imagine that on average, and maybe we're a little bit less transient than the average city, but he said, on average, pastor, consider that you have somebody for three years. And mm. so that's what I, I think about that a lot. Um, you know, the uh, college student will have for four years, uh, but residents, fellows, I mean, you, you just never know. Right, Master yeah. programs, uh, people who get married and leave or have a kid and move somewhere mm -hmm. else, um, retire and go to their grandkids. So I love when we have people for 10, 20, 30 years, but mm -hmm. I go, okay, in three years, man, I think we could teach them a lot of Bible. I think yeah. we can be in a gospel. I think we can be an epistle. I think we can be in a prophet. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and then I think in terms of, oh, this is maybe too intense, but go, the language I've used in the past is come and see, go and die series. And uh, the come and see series are the very uh, attractional, mm -hmm. uh, it's August, new people are coming in. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm um, watering down what I'm yeah. teaching on. I'm just like, okay, what would be a great series mm -hmm. as we're starting the fall? Uh, and then the Go and Die series are more of like the, man, I think this is a little bit of a slower time in the life of our church. I think we've got our core key committed here, and it's time to grow really deep. So yeah. a classic example would be like, okay, let's go into the Psalms for the summer. That would be a classic thing churches do. Okay, the Psalms isn't necessarily, it could be, the most attractional series ever, mm -hmm. but hey, do you want to deepen your prayer life this summer with us? Let's do that. So we tend to do several come and see and then to a go and die series. That's good, and I think uniquely you hit on this earlier, but you're also really in tune with the spirit and that you're willing to change the plan at any time. Yes. And we have to be flexible to accommodate that too. Will you talk about that? For yeah, a yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've done that a couple times. We mentioned this last week, so I won't go into great detail again, but we, we did that with, we're going to do Hebrews and we did the one initiative instead. Um, we were, I can't remember what we're going to do something. And then we did the conversation list. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, I just had a, I literally had just had a staff person, for example, um, call me the other day and say, Kyle, We've got a lot of new believers. I don't know if we're going to do this mm -hmm. or not. He said, we have a lot of new believers in our church. And he said, man, I think a four or five week series on some of the fundamentals of the faith would be That's really, unique. really yeah. helpful in the next year. And so I said, kind of what I just told you, I said, well, okay, let me think about this. Well, I'm pretty planned out mm -hmm. for the rest of the year. But let me think, is that, without going into detail of everything else we're going to do, I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth going, is that is that the best thing? So sometimes just yeah. listening to other staff who have their ear to the ground and go, if you think about first uh, Corinthians which we're in 2 Corinthians. But 1 Corinthians is Paul's response to the questions a church was asking. Yeah. And so sometimes I want to be like, okay, what are the things that our church needs? I don't want to act like I always know that. That's why the mm -hmm. vast majority of the diet is going to be expositional preaching. But to give you an example, we did a series right, was it right after COVID, we did the identity series. Yeah. And that was a, hey, it's been crazy and everybody's been all around and we need to go back to the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of a, you know, we did uh, the gospel and and worshiper and sir. Anyway, we did all that. Much more of a topical, I would call it a yeah. topositional series. Yeah. We took a topic and then we traced that theme through a passage in scripture. And we try to find a thread in every, every oh, book yes. of Bible we go through. Yes, yeah. yes. So, um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, you know, I was thinking uniquely too on how even the text you choose ahead of time, six months to a year ahead of time, uniquely like the spirit moves in that too. I, I was just thinking today, like, could we have known what our church family was going to go through this past year when we put Habakkuk on the schedule? And like, that's the Lord's goodness yes. to us. Can yeah. Again, I, I had no idea. I mean, I, I I knew it was like a little Job book. That's how I thought of it in my mm -hmm. own mind. Hey, it's a book on suffering. We're probably not going to go right now through 42 yeah. chapters of Job, but let's, let's go through uh, Habakkuk or Habakkuk. Yeah, didn't know what was going to happen in the months leading up to it. Didn't you know? I just was met, meeting with a family yesterday. Was at their house, and they had some physical ailments, and they were like, "Man, you know this mm -hmm. this Habakkuk series could not have come at a better time." Yeah. It's like, all right, that's where we just trust that you know. Again, I'm like, to me, part of the adventure is let's pick a book of the Bible, let's pray about it, and let's preach it. And then, like I said, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in Second Corinthians, yeah. and I'm I'm kind of excited about that. Like we have some themes, we have some ideas, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's like. I remember preaching through Ephesians and um, and even the book of James, I'm thinking, and some of the most obscure passages in my mind were the ones that people said, that that sermon, that text, that was for me, where I, where I was thinking, oh no, the book of James, it's going to be the trial sermon at the beginning, yeah. it's going to be big. It's like, no, it wasn't. I don't know what God's going to do. Yeah, no, and I think that's really unique when we think about that, the idea that like the Lord knows what he has for our church and each book of the Bible that you teach through. But uniquely, he knows what he has for each individual that's going to sit under that teaching. Yes. Something unique happens in that moment when a person is sitting in a sermon where the Lord is speaking through you directly to them. Can you talk about that for me? 
Yeah, uh, ask the question one more time, just so just I just the idea what you're of saying. how the Lord can speak directly to people as they're sitting and listening to your sermon, like that He's prepared something for them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm amazed at the things that people come and tell me afterwards, whether it's in the lobby or I get an email. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I, I, I'm pretty sure sometimes people say, "Man, when you said," and they quote me, and I'm like, "I don't even think I, I said think that." I said you that, know, yeah. I'm like. <laughs> um, you know, but yeah, I, I think people are again. What I, one of the things I try to do is is another preaching hack, if there's such a thing, yeah. is I tend to think through what are the five or six categories that people deal with, and mm-hmm. I don't think there's many more than you know they're going to have emotional, mental issues, yeah. they're going to have financial issues, uh, they're going to have health issues, uh, they're going to have relationship issues. Then there's the whole category of unique spiritual demonic activity, um, mm-hmm. and so I'm probably forgetting a few off the top of my head right now. But when I think about, I try to think about w- what I try to think of is those categories, and then different types of people in the room. I, I, and I'm not great at hitting them all, but I'm like, okay, there's single people in here, there's single moms in here, uh, there's single guys in here, so that's all different. Uh, there's newlyweds in here. There's people who think their marriage is a two out of ten and is always going to be. There's people who are having a great marriage, and there's teenagers here who want to be here. There's teenagers who don't want to be here. You know, mm-hmm. and so there's empty nesters. We can go on and on. And so it, I think one of the things that I had to learn in preaching and teaching, a big learning curve for me, was you know the first ten years of teaching and preaching, I was teaching to eighteen to twenty two year olds. So yeah, it was very easy to preach. The, uh, not easy, but like, okay, guys, you know, and, and, and you you kind of have like, a, you're older than them all. So you're mm-hmm. like, all right, guys, one day you're going to have a house and you're going to get married. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know? <laughs> and then when I got here, I was like, man, I'm, I'm preaching to people my parents and grandparents' age. And uh, I've got to start thinking about how to apply this text. And, and again, that's one of the reasons, maybe we need to talk about this, but one of the things that's helped me get better is for the first, well, seven years almost, we did sermon uh, review. Sermon review, yeah. So, which was basically, uh, I learned this from JD. It's the whole idea of like, if you want a culture of feedback, then you have to mm-hmm. critique what the uh, the most important thing that happens in yeah. the church, which would be the preaching of the word. Mm-hmm. And so literally from day one, I don't think we've ever had a, uh, I mean, there's been some exceptions, but in general, rarely do I preach a sermon that there has not been some type of feedback preemptively given. We've changed it in the new building to where I actually preach a version of the sermon on late Thursday yes. morning to a handful of you and get some feedback. But to me, and that's always where you guys can go, hey, you know, Pastor Jordan will be in there and he'll say, hey, you know, from a perspective of the care pastor, you may have forgotten this, or you might say, hey, listen, don't forget about women with this, or some, anyway, you know. Or I'm, you might not want to say that that yeah, way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you sounded angry when you said that. And so, um, and then honestly, I've always been open to feedback uh, yes. in between services even, you know. Mm-hmm. And then Saturday services for a long time were, you know, Pastor Dave, Pastor Caleb, others who were around mm-hmm. would just give me some feedback. And so, and then I, I'm kind of weird about this, but I watch all my sermons. And so, um, like the Thursday sermon is recorded, and then I'll watch it before I preach on Sunday. Mm-hmm. And then I'll watch the Sunday morning sermon before I preach it on Sunday night. Yeah. And that's just for me, like, I want to I want to be an expert at the craft. I want to learn what I'm doing wrong. I want to mm-hmm. see what I'm doing well and just try to get better. And really, that's the only way someone's going to become a better pre- preacher, like teacher. Yes. Is allowing others <clears throat> to critique them and being willing to critique yes. y- yourself. And there's nothing like, and I know a lot of guys don't have a lot of services, but there's nothing like, in my opinion, preaching the same sermon to different people on the same day. Mm-hmm. Um, because then you, you, what I've realized is, is so much is, uh, there's three things. There's the preparation of the sermon. Mm-hmm. There's the proclamation of the sermon. And then there's who's in the room yeah. and how they're responding. And I have preached the same sermon to our church and they've been fired up. And then I've gone and been asked to go speak at some, you know, Mm-hmm. Christian college, but they're not really that excited that mm-hmm. I'm there. The students are, and I'm like, this message is the same message, but this is not the same message. I mean, yeah. it is it is being received completely differently in this environment than it is when That's I preach that same message at our church. That's really good. I was thinking about, I saw a reel the other day on Instagram, and you happened to send it to me too, which was cool, where there were these little pinpoints, and it was like your neighbor, um, your grandma, like all these different people yep. who might come, you might invite to church for the weekend. And I just think about you standing on the stage and staring out and imagining those people and those seats and like what uniquely if they were to come in contact with the text even on their own that the Lord would want to say to them and there's yeah. a lot that you have to just rely on the Holy Spirit I'm sure for that yeah, as well yeah yeah and I don't you know my sermon is probably you know 90% of my sermon is like I mean I write a full sermon but I would say 90% of it is what I've written down yeah. somewhere that I'm saying and then 10 sometimes 15 sometimes 20% depending on the day is, is on the spot sometimes that's 
Sometimes this will get me in trouble, but also sometimes that's what's, <laughs> that's what's the best parts of the sermon. I'm trying to speak to the people in the room. That's yeah. who I'm speaking to. And, you know, and one of the things that I'll do before I go out, I mean, I do several things, but like I'll try to go on stage just a little, it's dark on the stage mm-hmm. and the video's on of some sort. And and I'll normally like, hopefully not in too weird of a way, but I'll look at the entire room yeah. and I'll just look at people and I'm just like, all right, these, okay, here's a lot of people here today and I really want to, you know, I want to speak to them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think another thing that young pastors do is they speak at people, they don't speak to them. And I think the way that you speak to people is you have to go two or three levels deeper in your application than you think you do. So a lot of pastors will say something like, you know, some of you are anxious and they'll think, well, that was, I bet they think I'm, that I'm really applying this to them. And that's not bad, but it's helpful to, that would be step one. Step two would be like, you know, hey, some of you are anxious every time you go home. Okay, that was a little bit better. Mm-hmm. A better version would be some of you get anxious every time you go home because um, you know that your wife is going to be unhappy with you. And uh, this is, I'm not trying to pick mm-hmm. on women. I, it could be either or. No, but right. all of a sudden you paint the picture of like, and in fact, what you do is you sit yeah. in your car and your heart beats in your chest and you don't, you don't even want to go home. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're like, that's the real. You feel that, it. That's the like, and when and you know that you're being real when the room is very quiet. Like mm-hmm. I can I can sense... Um, and I'd love my whole sermon to be like this. It's not, but I can sense in the room where everybody's quiet, everybody's learning at the exact same time. It's called, I think it's officially psychologically called the zone of proximal development. We say just say the zone, yeah. but it's like when everybody's learning together, because I think as a teacher, what you want to hear when you're speaking is nothing. You want, you want, mm-hmm. you want the room to be, if people are moving around, if people are checking their phones, they're distracted. They're distracted. Yeah. So trying to, one of my goals is to, continually create an environment. I want I want people to feel like in my sermon the time mm-hmm. is flying by. Um, you know, I think every I always tell young guys every sermon should feel like it's 20 minutes. Yeah. So some guys preach for 10 minutes and it feels like it's been 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. But there are other guys, I, I listened to a guy years ago, his sermon on average length was like an hour and 20 minutes and but it was so f- fast. It was so yeah. interesting. It was yeah. historical, it was cultural, it was funny, it was interesting, it was applicable, it was mm-hmm. all that. That's really good. I want to, something you said uh, made me think of something. You know, I I really, I just want to give you the opportunity to speak to this. We talked about you receiving feedback from our staff, but what a lot of people don't see is that you often will get critiques of things that you say on the weekend. That's right. Um, And uniquely, anytime that you're in a position of authority or on a platform, you're more open to attack from others who, who really maybe aren't looking to assume the best. Is there, is there anything you would say to that? Uh, you know, ter- this is an old Billy Graham saying, turn your critics into coaches. So I, I try to, I genuinely, uh, my conscience is clear on this. I mean, I, yeah, I try to, okay, what is the grain of truth in this, yeah. in this, uh, you know, obviously I take it more seriously, the more connected that person is to our church. Mm-hmm. If it's some random person who's, you know, occasionally happens, who's trying correcting me on, you mm-hmm. know, I think one time, here's a great, a great example. I said, you can't change your IQ. Mm-hmm. And this is something I'd read about. Hey, you can't change your IQ for make it any higher. Um, you can uh, you know, you can make it lower by being malnourished as a child or not being fully educated, but there's nothing you can do to make your IQ higher. And I'd mm-hmm. read that, I'd heard that. And then some lady who I'd never heard of, um, uh, who I don't believe is in our church, this was years ago, sent me this long email with an article on the IQ. And, and so some of that's like, okay, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe yeah. I won't use that illustration again or whatever. Uh, maybe I'll read the article, but at the same time, who is this person who has the time to write me three or four paragraphs and connect this article? And why, mm-hmm. why is she so passionate about the IQ thing? And mm-hmm. so I try to, con- as my grandma used to say, yeah. consider the source, you know, <laughs> of, of my That's critique. Good. But I, but I genuinely like, okay, you know, I, you know, I, you know, classic kind of low level critiques. Hey, Kyle talks too fast. Okay, well, fair enough. I mean, I'm, yeah. so let me work on that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. I still talk fast, but that's a good one. Uh, you know, okay, Kyle, you could be a little bit more grace oriented in your sermons. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair enough. You know, the, the, these are more like. Less email critiques and more just like genuinely people. I had a lady, here's a great one. I had a lady tell me one time, um, hey, when you talk about people dying, um, you really, I would appreciate it if you would use the language of when someone dies, we move forward, we don't move on. You said move on. And I was like, okay, this was like a year or two ago. And she was right. And I was like, you know, okay, this is great. You know, this is why I think, I think, of course, this is not easy for me to say as the teacher preacher, Mm but I think you need anyone who's speaks publicly for a living needs to get like a 10% grace. You know, it's like, I often feel like, like I'm like, guys, I'm speaking without notes 
every weekend for 50 minutes. Yeah. So I'm probably going to make a mistake or say something I didn't mm-hmm. or slip up or, you know, every once in a while I tell a joke that, you know, I thought was funny and it, it is funny <laughs> to most people, but not, you know. Not a few. It's yeah. not, a, not a few. And then I've got to count that. Another thing real quick on this is sometimes people want me to put airbags. We've, mm-hmm. you know, I've had this conversation yeah. with, with some of the staff, like um, they'll, they'll want me to put airbags around something. They're like, well, you know, if you're going to say that, please remember that, you know, there may be someone out here who's bipolar, schizophrenic, and would take that the wrong way. It's like, okay, I want to consider that. I want to consider the bipolar, schizophrenic person who may take that the wrong way and think I'm attacking. But if I put airbags around everything, Mm -hmm. then preaching would lose its appropriate sting and Mm -hmm. bite. So I think just so people know, if I'm guessing the people who listen to this podcast are the ones listening to my preaching, um, I would rather, as this is a philosophical thing, I would rather be a little bit more direct um, less airbags and hit the people that need to be hit yeah. and have the follow-up calls, conversations to go, I'm not talking about you, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm so, and, and then normally they're like, I know, I just wanted to double check. And yeah. I'm like, okay. Because because usually there's just, I, I'm preaching to the person who's resisting the truth. Mm-hmm. And if I give them the airbag, that's their way out. And their spouse is like, oh, you well, just I, gave them the way out. I think times when you have felt like, oh, maybe I should have said that differently. Like, you've made adjustments in the future. And uh, yes. I think that's important for people to know, too. Like, when you see truth in something someone's saying, you consider it. Yes. And you take action on it. And you're a very teachable, humble guy. And the last thing that you're ever wanting to do is, like, intentionally offend anyone. And I, th- yes. I think people need to know that about you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and the tension in, in preaching and in ministry is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard tension to get to because, you know, every once in a while it's like I've got to say something really, really hard about, you know, like, let's take singleness, for example. It's like, you know, at one level, you may need to hit, like, the guys. And guys, you need to yeah. grow up, and you need to get, you get responsible. And But then there may be a guy that's been like, dude, I'm doing this. And so I need the other word of, like, hey, man, and God's gracious, and God's going to make a way, and, yeah. and singleness is an option, and celibacy is a good thing, and look at the Lord Jesus. And so that's it's good. always hard to get all that tension. That's why I think, you know, people need, not just me, anyone they're listening to, I think you need six or ten sermons mm-hmm. of listening to that person's heart, hopefully, yeah. across a theme, a topic, a book to kind of go, okay, I get it, you know. That's really good. I want to make sure we have time to talk about this. Like, we've talked a lot about how how you prepare and things that you consider, but what are some ways that you will prepare for a specific sermon and study for a specific sermon? Uh, yeah, so, you know, blank screen Monday for me. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm I, in seven and a half, almost eight years, I, I'm almost never ahead. Where I'm, gonna, I'm trying to change that mm-hmm. with my scheduling and getting ahead some more for to help comms yeah. team and some other things. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, once, so, but, but by the time, what, what I have on Monday based on a lot of work we did, you and I have done and others have done, is I, I did know this Monday, for example, mm-hmm. that I was going to be preaching on 2 Corinthians yeah. 1, 1 through 11. I know that come this coming Monday, it's going to be 2 Corinthians 1 on 12 to the end of chapter mm-hmm. 1. And so that's what I have. Yeah. Um, what I'm doing is, you know, of course, I'm reading the text, praying through it, looking, I, really what mm-hmm. I am is I'm a keyword preacher. Yeah. I mean, in one sense, it's like I'm looking at the text going, okay, the word comfort's really key here. The mm-hmm. word grace is key. The word peace is key. Mercies is key. Uh, oh, the Apostle Paul, let's talk about him. So I, in one sense, I am a key word preacher. Yeah. What are the key words? And from that, let's go in different directions. Um, then what I normally do is I am probably – I have like three to five iCloud notes up at a time on my phone. And I'm always listening. I probably, on any text I preach on, I probably am reading three to five commentaries. I can talk a little about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably listening to uh, five to ten sermons. Who do you listen to? Depends. Uh, So a couple different things. I mean, I really like Skip Heitzig. Uh, I would love Skip Heitzig to come speak here at some point. Skip is like in his, do you know who he is? Send him this podcast. Yeah, there you go. Uh, he's in his probably mid sixties. He's, he's a pastor of Calvary Chapel in Mm -hmm. Albuquerque. A lot of the Calvary Chapel guys is who I listen to because basically the Calvary Chapel guys, they all, not all of them, most of them do Wednesday night Bible Mm -hmm. studies. So it's not always sermons. I should say I'm listening to their commentary on the text. Okay. Um, and so what I do is, uh, and, and so, so I, I, I like Joby Martin, who's mm-hmm. a guy down in at 11:22. Of course, I've got a, where we came out of J.D. Yeah. Greer. Uh, so there's there's some people that I'll revisit again and again and again. Um, and then there are so so the first thing I'll do is yeah I'll listen to some sermons usually at two x maybe that's one of the reasons I talk so fast. <laughs> and I'm I'm looking for like what are themes, keys, ideas. Sometimes they'll say a statement in a sermon that I'm like. I wish you would have talked more about that. And so yeah. then I'll be like, I want to talk more about that. That's, that's a that's a great theme that you hit on. Or um, so and then I, I like I like I don't read really 
technical commentaries. So there's like, there's like, in my opinion, there's like the very shallow commentary. I try not to read that one either. Um, and then there's the very technical one. It's very big. It's like, you know, you get first Corinthians and it's like got two parts to first Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's usually telling you every argument and you're going into the original languages and it's just very long and it's very true, not very clear or real. Mm -hmm. I really like pastoral commentaries. So I like, um, anything Warren Wearsby. He just passed away in last year or two. He's like, he was in his like nineties. He has a whole it's called B, B E, B series. Oh, okay. I don't know that I've ever preached a book of the Bible without uh, a Warren Wearsby commentary near me. I just love, he helps me think big ideas, big themes. Does he have uh, one for Second Corinthians? Oh, yeah. We'll link it. Oh, yeah. Um, and then uh, I really like the, what is it? What is that one? The blue ones? Do you know what I'm talking about? That, uh, for the for for you the for you thank you like Galatians for you, for you Second Corinthians for Those you are great. Uh, so I would say my three favorite if I was looking for um, what am I trying to say uh, series I like the B series by Warren mm-hmm. Wiersbe I like the uh, Bibles or for you series that's by a mm-hmm. bunch of different people and I like the Bible Speaks Today series Bible Speaks Today is probably the best. Technical meets pastoral, like there. Um, I I yeah, one. John Stott, who has okay. written many of those. Yeah. Uh, but I would say I, I'm reading those. I'm looking for themes, ideas. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, man, oh, that's a great. You know, I think. Uh, what was it? Is it? Maybe it was this week, or mm-hmm. maybe it's next week. I can't remember. There, w- there was a theme that that I ended up not tracing so far. But there was a theme that um, Warren Wearsby had in his commentary on chapter one on discouragement. And I thought, you know, because Paul is discouraged in one Mm -hmm. sense. He said, I almost died, you know, and I thought I had to wrestle with, okay, do I chase the theme of discouragement? That would be a different sermon than a sermon on comfort. Yeah. So anyway, I I use them as conversation partners. That's great. Um, But again, probably by Monday, because I'm kind of always listening to them in the background. Um, I'm done with that. The other thing I'll do is if there's a clear theme that I know I'm going to address, I'll try to find the best book or two on that. Yeah. I keep going back to forgiveness. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a great book on forgiveness called, I think, Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. So if I'm ever going to teach on, on forgiveness, I'll probably reference it. It's a whole book on forgiveness. Or Tim Keller wrote a book on forgiveness right mm-hmm. before he passed. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll, my three resources are other people's sermons, um, commentaries, and books on topics that are addressed in that passage. That's great. And those kind of help me. That's what gets me kind of to Monday to then begin to kind of, you know, what are the main That's great. points? How yeah. do you internalize your sermons? Uh, um, like I've seen you walking around the block. Yeah, to, to yeah, yourself. yeah. I like, do that a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, I lots of prayer walks, lots of talking to myself, lots of looking crazy. Um, no, I meant that as a positive. No, 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 no. I know, I know that. <laughs> but I, I'm trying to think, like you know. So real quick back to my schedule. So so what I try to do is I try to get about five pages done a day. So my average outline That's is twenty great. pages. Yeah. So I try to get about five six pages done a day. Um, I have a whole coloring system for my. It's, it's like a like a middle school girl. Like my my uh, you know what my outlines Sermon look like. I've got yeah. I've got you know if it's I've got if it's an illustration I use red. If it's yeah. an application I use green. If it's a big point I put it in a certain font. Mm-hmm. If it's um, basically at the end of the day you have to see in one of my outlines to do yeah. this. But basically, um, I have a lot of things highlighted that are big. Mm-hmm. What I would call like what are my main placeholders. So for example, this week, I want to talk about Paul. I want to talk about who he is. And I want to talk about the church of Corinth. That's going to be like my first big placeholder. And then I'll kind of memorize what are the big ideas. And then I want to kind of be free to talk about, I think another thing I try to do is I try to over, I have way more content than I will ever uh, share with anybody. And that's what I want to be. I want to be at the I think you can tell when someone's teaching and they're at the end of their knowledge. Yeah, They're like, I don't know that he knows a lot about this. I want people to feel like I, and I want to be able to say to people, hey, guys, sorry, we're talking about grace and peace. We got to move yeah. on. And yeah. I didn't tell you everything I knew about grace and peace. Okay. I told you some things that I thought were really helpful right so now. So that you'll go and listen to the podcast. There later. it is. There it is. <laughs> yes. No, that's good. That's really good. I, I, I think kind of where I want us to end today, you know, as a pastor, reading the word, studying the word, teaching the word, that's your job. Yes. And, you know, as someone that works in ministry, I have felt in a different way, not nearly the way that you've probably felt it. The feeling of like, okay, like my faith is my job. How how does that affect your walk with the Lord? And what are some things that you put in place to make sure that you your walk with the Lord is staying uniquely personal as well? Yeah, that's great. Great question to end on. Um, you know, I think I think what you're describing is what I've heard described as the functional relationship that particularly a senior senior pastor mm-hmm. can have with God's word. 
which is, you know, I'm in it all the time, but I'm in it so that I can give something to other people. Yeah. Um, and so for me, yeah, it's it's hard for me to think about – it's hard for me to read any passage and not think how would I teach on this. <laughs> um, I mean, really. Um, a couple things that I do there, – there's two different camps. Well, there's probably 10 camps, but two camps I've heard of. Um, yeah. One camp basically says – there needs to be no difference between whatever you're studying and your devotional life. Like, like that is like, if, so for me, that would be like, Hey, you know what? Your devotions for the next three months are second Corinthians as you just kind of like, you know, that'd be one train of mm-hmm. thought. And I'm sympathetic to that. That's like, Hey, let this affect you as deeply as possible before you give it to other people. That's great. There's another train of thought, um, which, I, and I kind of, not perfectly. I kind of do both. I'm very ensconced in second Corinthians and I will be this whole time. Um, but then I try to do a, lighter reading. So here's what I do. I do a lighter reading, not study of other portions of scripture. That's so right great. now I'm reading first and second Kings. And so now I did end up sharing a staff devotional that came out <laughs> of did. it. Okay. But, but in general, I w- I'm not reading it to give other people that information. Mm-hmm. I'm reading it and I'm reading about, you know, just Elijah and Elisha and their mm-hmm. ministries and, and, and then I journal a lot. So that's, that's that's a personal thing that's totally separate. You know, my journals are not shared. I don't yeah. they don't make it into my sermons. And that's where I try to process what's going on. So I think for me it's a short but consistent reading of scripture that's yeah. that's much it's very devotional. Like I I went through a whole series where I just woke up and you know, whatever uh, day it was, I read that proverb. Yeah. You know, that, that, yeah. that was like, you know, I, I tried different things. I have found, uh, you know, I've had a love-hate relationship like most people have with through the Bible in a year. Yeah. I, I, you know, because what happens with me is sometimes I'm like, no, I need to spend a lot of time in what I'm mm-hmm. teaching right now. But if I'm going to stay on track, I got to be reading another four chapters of, of something that feels disconnected from what I'm actually trying to mm-hmm. think about and teach right now. So. No, that's really I don't know interesting. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Is there any encouragement as we close today that you would give to people who who just have a hard time getting in the word and don't know where to start? Um yes, I would say uh, a couple cl- quick things. One, get a Bible that you uh feel like you would actually read. Yeah. So I mean that like, you know, I mean that in like you may want to start with the message version of the Bible. Like it's you know, there's I, I've read the Old Testament, the message, it's great. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's a paraphrase. I know that. Yeah. Okay. But I would, if you don't know what the message is, you know, you do. But the, yeah, it's it's a very like paraphrased version of the Bible yeah. or New Living Translation. I, we that, we preach out beautiful. of the e, that's another easy translation to read. Or, or read a Bible you're excited about reading. Like, go mm-hmm. get yourself, invest, go get yourself a cool study Bible. Yeah. And I know it sounds shallow, but get, get yourself a leather one you like and oh, you I feel have a good about one Oh, yeah. With columns that I can write. Yeah. In. And then I, I would say, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew. I would start with something small. I would mm-hmm. do like, you know, let's do Galatians. Let's let me read yeah. Colossians. And like I said this in a few weeks ago, I think I think sometimes you gotta pick books, sometimes you gotta pick burdens. Yeah. So is is there a book that I'm just really, you know, it's like need to know, need to grow. What do I want to know about? Mm-hmm. Like maybe I just feel like I need a lot of wisdom. Okay, go to the Proverbs, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, maybe I'm I'm newly married. Okay, why don't you yeah. just do a study on what the Bible says about marriage? You don't have to necessarily read mm-hmm. directly through books of the Bible, though I think that's the best healthy long term diet. Mm-hmm. But I think and then I would say don't do it alone. You know, I think that we we are so. I have to continually remind myself mm-hmm. that until about three hundred years ago, we couldn't read our own Bibles. This is so important. You know, I really think. I mean, okay, so Christianity flourished for you know seventeen hundred years without personal Bible study. I, it's a weird thing because I, I, I value personal Bible study, mm-hmm. but if you think about it, uh, before a person w- could one be literate, two mm-hmm. uh, have the printing press, three afford a Bible in their language, mm-hmm. um, you know, probably four have the time. Um, I think we're in a place now where it's like it's a great blessing, but most people learn the Bible by gathering with others over a single copy and talking about it. Yeah. And so I think uh, the more you read the Bible with other people, the more engaging it can be. Maybe the last thing I'll say, these are just practical off the top of my head, very is um, you know, we just live uh, – Audible has taken off. Podcasts have taken off. Mm-hmm. I think the audio Bible is great. I, oh, I, I don't get anything for saying this, but I think Dwell, for example, uh, they have a monthly subscription, yeah. you know. Um, you know, it's something I invest in every year and it's, mm-hmm. and I can, I can choose, I love it. I can choose the speed they read it at. I can choose, I like to have an English guy read me. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, I can choose the music in the background. Mm-hmm. I can choose whether or not I just want to listen or I want to listen and read along. And so mm-hmm. I think those, like anything, variety is the spice of life. Yeah. Mix it up, you know, journal, don't journal, read a lot at once, you know, uh, we, we can't end a podcast without, um, referencing Andy Jump again. No. Nope. But Andy <laughs> Andy said, and I never heard anyone else say this, but he said, my favorite method of reading the Bible is rush. And I was like, what is rush? He goes, read until something <laughs> happens. Amen. And so I just think, man, that's not what you do. Lord, I want you to speak to me. I want to pray through this. God, I want to, I'm willing to respond to what you say here. 
Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. There you go. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for teaching us and leading us every week. And we should do this again sometime. I would love it. Thanks so much. Let's do it.